Recently, I watched a wonderful video production of John Bunyan's classic book, The Pilgrim's Progress. The vivid dream that the pilgrim experienced on his way to the celestial city brought afresh to my mind that the gospel is found along a narrow path, not the broad way to destruction. And in order for souls to make it safely to heaven, to the celestial city, we have to enter through a narrow gate along a path that takes us to the cross of Jesus, where all the burdens of our sins are rolled away. But then that's just the beginning, and it's not the end of the path of salvation. We have to walk out and work out our salvation with godly fear and trembling. That's what the Bible says, because there are many pitfalls along the way. And although we're saved by faith in Jesus at his cross, we still have to keep walking on that narrow path until we safely reach the celestial city, avoiding the slough of despond, avoiding being captured in Doubting Castle by giant despair. But the clear path to salvation through Jesus is not what our children hear nowadays at schools, and it's certainly not the message that we hear on secular TV and radio. The message that we hear today is that there are many paths way to God, that all religions are equal, and while Jesus was a good moral man, he's not the be-all and the end-all. Yet historic Christianity insists that Jesus is indeed the be-all and the end-all. Historic Christianity claims that every person needs Jesus. John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, first published in 1678, certainly encapsulated the gospel that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by Jesus. So I thought it would be appropriate to take a few minutes to share with you why Jesus is still the most important person to everybody on the entire face of the earth. You see, at the end of the day, the most important question you'll ever be asked is what will you do with Jesus? Everyone on this earth, according to this Bible, has need of Jesus Christ. First of all, we need him as our mediator between ourselves and a high and holy God. And secondly, we need Jesus as the mentor of all mentors. We need Jesus as our life coach. Now, what about this mediator business? What is a mediator? A mediator is a middleman who makes transactions between two parties, sometimes irreconcilable parties. Most people think they're good enough to approach God without a mediator. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible has left a, a testimony for time and eternity that Jesus is the mediator who is empowered by God to reconcile sinners to God Almighty. Apparently, God being God has decided that we sinners have been contaminated by sin and we're not to approach him without a go-between. In fact, if we turn in the New Testament to 1 Timothy and chapter 2, verse 5, it declares that there is one mediator between God and man and his identity is the man, Christ Jesus. In Hebrew, his name is Messiah Yeshua. The Bible teaches very simply that God sent Jesus to this world on a specific mission, and that mission was to reconcile sinful man back to God. You see, God created man as good, but we've mutated. We've sinned. Jesus became a man to bridge the gap between us and God. Jesus accomplished reconciliation between the sinful species of man and a holy God by offering himself as the blood sacrifice for our sins. So now we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of our sins. That is, if we put our trust and faith in him. 
Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7 in the New Testament says that we surely have redemption through his blood. We have the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. In fact, Jesus made a very exclusive statement in the gospel in John chapter 14. In verse 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He himself is the door, that narrow gate in the allegory of Pilgrim's Progress. We can't go around and think we'll be accepted any other way. You see, we desperately need Jesus because according to the Bible, we can't slip in through a back door. He is the only way and means that a sinner can be reconciled straight to God. The question is, have you ever received Jesus? Has there ever been a time, a point in time, when he became your personal savior? Perhaps you have put off making that decision, not thinking it's necessary to be related to Jesus. But the scary thing is that the Bible says he is absolutely necessary. And I think every day of people who are perishing without him, you do need him. And how, the Bible says, will you escape if you neglect so great a salvation? Why is the salvation that Jesus offers so great? It's great because it's free. You don't have to work for it, and you certainly can't pay for it. Jesus accomplished all the work of redemption and pleased God on our behalf. But you still must please God by doing something. You must, by faith, receive this free gift of eternal life that Jesus has procured on our behalf. Because you see, God honors free will. He won't force redemption upon us. We must decide for ourselves that we need this redemption that Jesus so freely offers. So receive him today. Receive him now before it's too late. Say, Jesus, I'm grabbing onto you now. I'm holding onto you for salvation. Come, Jesus, and stay with me. Live with me. Live in me. Forgive me. Heal me, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Won't you take Jesus now? Oh, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He makes me an heir of salvation because I am cleansed spiritually by his blood. By faith in his blood, my sins, the Bible says, have been remitted. And you know what? A second reason that we need Jesus is that he will watch over us. He promises to intercede for us all of our lives from his position at the very throne of God. In fact, have you ever wondered what Jesus has been doing for the past 2,000 years? Ever since he was raised from the dead and he ascended back to the Father, what has he been doing? For the past 2,000 years, he's been interceding on behalf of of believers who've put their trust in him. The Bible teaches that he presently is seated at God's right hand where he ever lives to make intercession for us. He also not just sits, but he stands up to honor and to receive martyrs who have died for his name and he stands to welcome them into eternity. The Bible says he serves as a lawyer, as our advocate with a holy God. So he is our high priest who enables us to come boldly to the Father's throne of grace to obtain mercy and help in every time of need. So you see, we need Jesus not only as Savior, but we need him to remain connected in close fellowship with God Almighty. But now we also need him as a life coach. It was Jesus who said in John chapter 10 and verse 10, Satan the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it abundantly. The Lord has promised to pour out into our lives by the power of his indwelling Holy Spirit, a supernatural peace, a shalom that surpasses all understanding. 
He lavishes our soul with love that passes knowledge and a joy that is inexpressible and full of glory. Furthermore, he promises to guide us throughout life and never to leave us nor forsake us. Our friends may leave us, they may die, but he's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And his words provide for us a solid foundation to build our lives upon. And his example is impeccable in service, in humility, in suffering, in perseverance, in the way he overcame evil. His hope sustains us even in the face of death. With Jesus, we'll never die alone. My friend, you see, it is my job and it's my solemn duty to challenge you. As an evangelist, I must challenge you. As we go through this life, we need to be in fellowship with our Creator and we need guidance to make the most of this life and to prepare for the life to come. And so that's why God says we need Jesus. We need Him as mediator because I said He will maintain our relationship with God and we need Him as mentor, as our life coach. Please remember those two M's. He's our mediator and our mentor. He guides us through this life and on to life eternal. We simply cannot risk going through life and facing eternity without Jesus, the world's only guaranteed Savior. But I have to say, this gospel, while it's an attractive gospel to open-minded people, it's also offensive to many people. This gospel of Jesus Christ offends people who resist the truth when they're told that they need Jesus. Some people just want to sing, I'll do it my way. Jesus himself, the Bible testifies, is the rock of offense. Even when he was walking on this earth, the Savior of this world offended people all the time, not because of his miracles and his compassion, but because, basically, of his truth. In the same way, when I preach Jesus today, there will still be, sadly, some folks who will resist the truth that Jesus brought to this world as the good news. But Jesus didn't apologize for his truth, and we can't apologize either. We just pray that you will not resist his truth. We strongly urge you to put your trust in him because the Bible says all other ground is sinking sand. There are many religions in this world. There are plenty of ways that seem right, but the Bible says their end is a dead end. Those who know and love God's word are not easily offended and will put our hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. Remember, grab hold of Jesus while you still can. We're living in a time of overlap when soon he will return as the judge of this earth. And you want and need him as Savior, not as your judge. Well, moving on, now we want to turn to another subject. And I hope in the West we cherish and appreciate the religious liberties that we have. Even the liberty to choose to believe in the Savior without being hauled off to prison. Although our religious freedoms are being seriously and dangerously eroded, nevertheless, we still have the privilege to worship freely in our homes and in our churches. But hundreds of millions of followers of Jesus today suffer severe discrimination, imprisonment, torture, kidnapping, and even martyrdom because they've decided to follow Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 3 exhorts us to pray for believers who are bound in chains, for those who are behind bars in prison because of their faith in the Messiah. I want to mention a ministry called The Voice of the Martyrs, a ministry I've admired for many years. It publishes a world map showing current persecutions and restrictions to the Christian faith. 
This map color codes the nations where the gospel of Jesus Christ is totally restricted or where conditions are, if not totally restricted, certainly hostile. The restricted nations include countries where government policy or practice prevents Christians from obtaining Bibles or other Christian literature. Also included are countries with anti-Christian laws that lead to believers being harassed, imprisoned, killed, or their possessions being taken from them. Those restricted nations include, in the Western Hemisphere, Cuba, uh, Belarus in the former Soviet Union, in Africa, Mauritania, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Sudan, Eritrea, and Somalia. In the Mideast, Israel is the only nation that is not labeled as hostile. But those nations labeled as restricted and hostile in the Middle East comprise the remainder of the Middle Eastern countries, including Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Jordan, the West Bank, and Gaza Strip, as well as Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and Iran. Other restricted nations for prayer are Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bhutan, Burma, China, North Korea, Laos, Vietnam, Malaysia, and Brunei. The dark green areas labeled hostile include large areas and nations where the government's attempt to provide protection for the Christian population, but where Christians are nevertheless victims of violence because of their witness. And these areas include, in the Western Hemisphere, Colombia. And in Africa, Mali, Ethiopia, and Nigeria. And in the Mideast, Jordan. And in Asia, India, Bangladesh, Nepal. Indonesia, and Mindanao in the Philippines. Well, we invite you to go to our website at exploits.tv to join our every Friday fast, to pray and fast for persecuted believers worldwide. So many of these persecuted believers live in Muslim-dominated nations, and so that's why the Holy Spirit has pinpointed Friday when many Muslims are in mosques and praying against Jews and Christians. There's also an international annual day of prayer for persecuted Christians sponsored by organizations such as Brother Andrew's Open Doors. But in a sense, every day is a day of prayer for persecuted believers. Brother Andrew, who has smuggled Bibles into restricted countries, and in our ministry, we've also smuggled Bibles into restricted countries. He made a great statement recently that truly echoed in my spirit because I believe and practice the same thing. He said, as followers of Christ, we must take a bold step. We must shed the enemy image we have of those who persecute us. You see, the moment we have an enemy image of anyone, God's love can no longer work through us to reach them. In a sense, God's love is blocked. We must pray for and even love those who hate us. And in my ministry, I don't look upon anyone as an enemy, but as a potential follower of Jesus, of Yeshua. All they need is for the light of revelation to break through. And they're no longer an enemy, but a brother or a sister in Messiah. So we have to speak up for the estimated 200 million Christians worldwide who live under persecution. As believers in the West, we must resist and speak continually against oppressive regimes. But we do as believers not only speak, speak against regimes, but we have to speak to God 
more often through prayer about these issues? Do we put enough pressures on governments to protect religious liberties? Are we putting enough pressure on God to answer our prayers? What's the solution? The Bible clearly teaches us that the solution to persecution is forgiveness and reconciliation, but with pressure of fasting and prayer. Here's a case in point. Brother Andrews said he was in a Christian town that was totally destroyed in one night by a wild Islamic mob. Tens of thousands of Christians were left homeless and they saw all their possessions destroyed. Brother Andrew didn't name the country, but I suspect it was Nigeria. They immediately organized a big gathering of Christians and Muslims. And the preachers spoke about forgiveness and reconciliation. Why? Because life goes on during and after persecution. Well, God greatly honored their actions. On that very same day, Brother Andrew received a telephone call from the main Muslim leader of the region. He said, can you please come and pray with me? I'm very sick. What an opportunity. And I believe it was prayer for those who persecute us that brought that open door. And not seeing the man as an enemy. So Brother Andrew decided to take a local pastor who had just been released from prison, by the way, and the pastor had suffered greatly because of persecution from Muslims. Together, along with other members of the Open Doors team, they went to the Muslim's home to pray for him at his invitation. They had, of course, the opportunity to explain exactly who Jesus is, that he really did die on the cross as Savior of the world, a fact that Islam doesn't teach, and that Jesus was more than a prophet. He was raised from the dead. And they began to pray, laying hands on this Muslim imam for his healing. And as Brother Andrew was praying, he felt a hand on top of his hand. He looked and it was the hand of the persecuted pastor who had just come from prison. I believe this is a perfect and beautiful illustration of the teaching of Jesus, that we must pray for those who persecute us. Believers in Messiah Yeshua, we do have an answer that the world doesn't know anything about. But as followers of Messiah Jesus, we must take a bold step. We must shed the enemy image we have of those who persecute us. The moment we have made them an enemy, God's love to a certain extent is blocked in us to reach them. We must pray for and even love those who hate us and just make a quality decision to see them, not as enemies, but as potential believers who need deliverance. I believe that's what Jesus meant when he instructed his disciples to pray for our enemies. We must see them in the correct light as redeemable human beings, because at one point we were all enemies of God as sinners. So in reality, the way we demonstrate our lives in front of others is the most powerful message we can share. Believers must be able to point to our hearts and say, God's in here. He lives in me. And I'm willing to die for him. I'm also willing to die for you because that's what Jesus did for all of us on the cross at Calvary in Jerusalem. Really, no other reality check will work in this age of confrontation. So I challenge you to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters and to see people not as enemies, but to act on behalf of the Lord in this needy world behind us, around us. Don't look on people as enemies, but as friends. While they are sinners, they must renounce sin, but they need someone to reach out a hand of love to them. Only then we will see a radical change take place in the lives of so-called enemy people. Only then will we see the love of Jesus replace the hatred that's in this world. 
Well, I hope you have come to the conclusion that I have that we are living in extraordinary times and each day is a gift to bring souls into the kingdom of God. Soon night is coming when no man can work, but we must work the gospel while it's still day. So I invite you to pray a simple prayer with me right now to receive Jesus as Savior while it's not too late. Would you do that? Just bow your head and pray with me. Heavenly Father, I do thank you that you've kept me, you've preserved me, and you've brought me now to the kingdom in such a dangerous hour. But I thank you that there's still time to reach out and say to Jesus, come into my heart. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I do believe, Father God, that you raised up Jesus from the dead. And I'm willing to confess now with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. Amen. I hope you prayed that prayer with me. Until next time, I'm Christine Darg, blessing you with the Lord's Shalom.